Hello and welcome to the Wednesday Total Soccer Show. I am Daryl Grove and I'm joined by a man who we've brought back all the way from 2006. It's Taylor Rockwell. Hello. Hello. I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> yeah. You've been here since 2009 with a brief hiatus in 2011. Yep, there you go. Right. 2011 through 2012, yep. Unlike Bruce Arena with the US national team, who mm-hmm. was coached from, what, 98 to 2006, then a 10-year hiatus, he is now the US national team coach that is going to lead us through the rest of World Cup qualifying. We sort of we knew it was coming. Mm-hmm. It became official yesterday afternoon. It did. A decade older, a decade wiser, so says he. That's what he says, uh-huh. right? Yeah. Um, so we've got to talk about Bruce Arena. Sure. I almost want to sort of pro and con it, because mm-hmm. a lot of people have been expressing their opinion in 140 characters. Mm-hmm. There's a lot more to it than that. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> so speaking of Twitter, the phrase I saw the most is step backwards. Yeah, I mean, that was on Twitter. I saw that a lot on Reddit. Uh, but basically, all of the responses to the Klinsman has been fired post were, I hope it's not Arena. And all of the responses to, it's probably going to re- be Arena, where this is a step backward, like way to shoot yourself yeah. in the foot. I was happy for five minutes, and now I'm sad again. That type of sentiment. So I think it's fair to say that the um, the take in the studio mm-hmm. is that we're not unhappy no. about a Bruce Arena appointment. So are we sort of, are we the out-of-touch podcast elite? What's going on here? <laughs> um, I mean, <laughs> I-, I think if you were looking at it from the, I watched the U- U.S. national team play, they haven't been exciting, they've been a pain to watch. I'm ready for something new and different, and that's what you expect a new coach to be. And when it's the coach you had, I think somebody phrased it as the replacement is the replacement's replacement, (laughs) or or like thereabouts. Um, And that's, I mean, more or less accurate that that's what Bruce Arena is. is He was replaced by Bob Bradley, who was replaced by Jurgen Klinsmann, who Uh was replaced by Bruce Bruce Arena. Arena. The circle of life. So you can see how it's sort of not the most exciting appointment Mm. from that perspective if you're a person who thought – I guess there were stories that really picked up steam yesterday that Bielsa was in serious consideration. There was one um, ESPN Deportes story, Mm -hmm. I think, that was just the – all I saw was a picture of Bielsa, the idea that he wanted $4 million Mm -hmm. a year and Landon Donovan as his assistant. I don't know if there's any truth to that rumor. Second sources, folks. Second (laughs) sources are important. But I think Bielsa is a good example of Mm -hmm. maybe the sort of – I want to call it – more exciting appointment that people were hoping for maybe that they wouldn't have seen as a step backwards. They'd have liked, I want to say, uh, Bielsa or Guardiola or Jurgen Klopp. <laughs> well, well I, wrote, I wrote the article for uh, for Pace Soccer. It's yeah. like the 10 types of manager that will mm-hmm. be linked with your national team vacancy. Bielsa was the sexy outsider. Yes. And uh, Pep Guardiola was the impossible dream, I believe, something so, like that. But the way I think of it is that people want someone with like a newfangled modern way of playing soccer. Yeah, you know what I mean, someone who would come in and be like, okay, guys, this is how we're going to do it. This is how I'm going to propel you into the future. And it's all about like pressing at 110% mm-hmm. intensity or something like that, right? Which I don't, and that's I, not what we get. Well, no, but and that's I don't disagree with that idea that if you are bringing in a new national team coach, you want it to be a person who has new ideas about like what to do with the team and yeah. new ideas for what direction they want to go in. Or even the, a high profile name, right? Just mm-hmm. someone who like similar to Klinsman is like, yeah. we got this guy, look what we got, we're US soccer, look mm-hmm. at this magnificent name that wants to uh, come and work with our players. And that's why people were upset about Bielsa, people were upset that Hinnink didn't get an interview, yeah. people were even upset that people like Fabio Capello weren't consulted. Ooh, um, I just should have. And I would say, I mean, I don't necessarily disagree with that. I talked about this a little bit on yesterday's show. The difference, though, would be that generally when you're hiring a new national team coach, it's after a tournament. So the Euros don't go well. England parts ways with Roy Hudson. Now you see what's available. Uh If the World Cup doesn't go well, as it did in 2006, you part ways with Bruce Arena. You see what else is out there. And even for the Euros for England, Mm -hmm. you've then got two years to prepare for the World Cup. Right? Right. World Cup qualifying started in Mm -hmm. September after the Euros. With the U.S., quite often... Um, the coach leaves after a World Cup. Mm-hmm. You've maybe got a Gold Cup in between to prepare mm-hmm. for, maybe two. Um, but you definitely have like four years until the World Cup, right? Right. There's time, and and so and yeah, and with that, and in mind, not in this case, and let's, going out. let's talk about time for a second, though, because when we were talking about firing Jurgen Klinsmann about if the United States was going to do that, one of the reasons why we said they should is because you have six months between these World Cup qualifiers when you part ways with Klinsmann and the next one's in March, right? But if you've made... The- Four months. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. yeah. F- yeah. Uh, I don't know why six months kept getting repeated, but it <laughs> did. That's weird. Uh, December, January, February, March. Yeah, f- yeah, four months. I don't know. What's wrong with you, Twitter? Anyway, uh, the point there being, though, that you have that four months, that's true, but you're probably going to have a January camp. Mm-hmm. And so it makes sense to part ways, but it doesn't make sense to delay. 
that you basically only fire that coach if you have a clear idea of who you want to come in as your interim temporary replacement to get things going again. Mm -hmm. So if you bring in Bielsa or Hiddink, you've got to do the interviews. You've got to go back and forth on negotiations. Then you've got to get them used to the That's setup. That's true. I didn't got, think of the admin. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you've got to get them <laughs> used to the setup. You've got to get them to meet everybody, to go around and meet people. Then they've got to get used to Major League Soccer. Then they've got to go look at their players abroad. I forgot about that too. There'll mm -hmm. be um, like the, the Rude Hullet at um, LA Galaxy yeah. situation where someone will come in and be like, what? How does this work? Yeah. Well, or just or just even that like Bielsa, for as aware as he is of global soccer, is probably not watching a lot of Major League Soccer. So he's got to mm -hmm. go through and watch a lot of footage and get used to the players, figure out who he wants to call into camp. Mm -hmm. I mean, and then you, you think he doesn't have like a, a strong take on Sebastian Legette? Probably not. Probably not. <laughs> so I think you do want somebody in the short term who's familiar with the system, who's yeah. familiar with the domestic league, who can come in, kind of not miss a beat, knows the people that are there, mm -hmm. and then get that camp underway in January, February. Knows the U.S. media mm -hmm. is like not meeting them for the first time. Right. And I think more important is that there is a game in March, and it's kind of um, a must win. Like mm -hmm. Most of the games in the, the short term for the hex, so all of 2017, give or take, mm -hmm. it's must win or we're not going to a World Cup, right? If you've got four years, you could bring yeah. in someone with um, uh, a very defined style and it's going to take national team players a long time to learn it, right? Look mm -hmm. how long it took Klopp to get Liverpool looking like mm -hmm. a Klopp team. Didn't happen until this season. Right. Like he had, like, what, 66% of last season? Didn't really happen full on until this season. You've got, we've got to get this team playing mm -hmm. by March or we risk not qualifying for the World Cup. Right. And that's where I think you don't need to bring in somebody who's going to reinvent the wheel. You need to bring in somebody who can... Be Knows how a wheel works? Yeah. It will just be <laughs> pragmatic and practical and yeah. kind of get things going. Uh -huh. And that is what Bruce Arena is going to be. And I think he's going to have very concrete ideas about what he wants to do, how he yep. wants to play, and honestly, who he's going to call in. I think he probably knows 20 of the 23 that he's uh -huh. going to bring in, and maybe he'll look at a few more. But he's going to be pretty practical in his approach. And I think that is what we both agreed the United States needs at this yep. point because things have been so inconsistent. Different names coming in, different formations being played, not an emphasis on tactics. I think mm -hmm. Bruce Arena corrects that. Again, I don't disagree that he is not the sexiest name yep. in any number of ways. Um, and He's that, also not like a tactically innovative kind of no. guy, right? Mm -hmm. It will mostly just be some sort of 4-4-2, 4-4-1-1, 4-2-3-1. But every player playing in that system will have like simple but specific instructions about what they need to do to make that system work. And that's yeah. going to be the big difference from Klinsmann to Arena. It doesn't mm -hmm. have to be some crazy, like, 3-4-3 three, three or anything like that yeah. to, make it, to make it a tactical success. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, Back to basics. And, and, uh, but I would like to say that I do hope that past does kind of serve as precedent, which is that, say, he does stay, he will stay through 2018, that tournament goes, okay, say the United States makes it out of the group, once again gets knocked out in the first knockout round. Mm -hmm. I would hope barring the fact that like United States is playing the best soccer it's ever played everybody wants to play for them everyone's happy if that's the case maybe he stays but I would hope the United States learns its lessons from 2002 and doesn't just stick with Arena because hey things seem fine yeah. that like you can't keep operating at a things are fine level and have them get better it's right. got to be things are fine but who's going to push us to that next level well that was supposed to be Klinsman right things were fine mm -hmm. with Bradley yeah. really in 2010 mm -hmm. and like 2011 Gold Cup I know we lost to Mexico in the final we were not looking bad mm -hmm. at all but the idea was we need this guy to take us to mm -hmm. the next level right. and what the way i look at this is that's kind of a gamble mm -hmm. that right now is failing because we lost the first two games of the hex we are bottom of the hex so in some ways this is a step backwards but it's the step it's a step backwards from the edge of a ledge and at the bottom of that ledge like that's a cliff at the bottom of that ledge is the u.s not qualifying for the world cup i uh, see i wouldn't even say it's it's a step backwards i would say it's a lateral step it's a step to the same step almost because if you look at the 538 graph that a lot of people have uh yes, shared and posted uh you know 538 if you still back them or not <laughs> the point is that they've done a, a chart that essentially shows like the kind of graph of u.s soccer managers and klinsman kept it about where it was yep. that he didn't he had some high highs and a lot of lows but he didn't really advance things that much and so with that in mind i think you bring in somebody who can steady the ship yep maybe move it up a little bit, but then you do still look at other candidates who could come in, change things up, get new players, get a new formation going, try innovative, uh, try an innovative approach, and then try to grow it from there. But first, we've mm -hmm. got to qualify for the work. Right, exactly. You, allow me this metaphor. Mm -hmm. then. It's a step backwards in that we were falling off the edge of a cliff mm -hmm. into non-World Cup qualification, and it's a safe step backwards away from the abyss. Yeah, yeah, right? absolutely. And, and with, that, with that idea of the abyss there, that like, 
you could also have interviewed Peter Vermees or Dom Kinnear or Jason Kreiss uh, or Caleb Porter, whomever. Uh, Jesse Marsh was the other one that I know a lot of people were, were interested oh, in. Right, huh? If we and, just name as many coaches. Yeah, right. <laughs> and say one of them just blows Sunil Galati away, blows away yeah. U.S. soccer in that interview, and they bring that, that coach in in this situation in a very stressful, you've got to get results – and say they lose their first three games. Right. Are and they fired? Perret has the guy that didn't get us to a World Cup. Exactly. Yeah. And that career is, is ruined. Like that idea of like a person who could then manage the national team down the road, could manage another national team, Solid. could get bigger and bigger jobs. They become, oh, but he's the one who couldn't get the U.S. national team to a World Cup. Yeah. Maybe we pass on him. Right. Yeah, I absolutely agree with that. Mm-hmm. All right. Let's go back to then um, another, th- another knock against Bruce Arena. Mm-hmm. Um, how come he was fired in 2006, but now he's the guy to hire? Which is... I think I have an answer to it, but it is a good question. Like, a guy we decided, okay, you're not the guy anymore. Mm-hmm. Why is he the guy now? Well, if you already have an answer, let's hear it. I want to hear your answer. Well, my answer is that the, um, the things he did to get fired in 2006 are no longer a problem for him. Because to me, okay, so first of all, for people who don't know the history, 2002, mm-hmm. Bruce Arena takes the U.S. to the quarterfinals of the World Cup. Huge success. 2006, Bruce Arena gets knocked out of the 2006 World Cup group stage. Mm-hmm. Part of the problem that I saw at the time, because I'd just come to this country in 2005, so I was getting familiar with the US team, is there were a lot of sort of arena favorites mm-hmm. who were still with the team, mm-hmm. right? For example, Claudio Reyna maybe should not have played such a big role in the 2006 World Cup. Mm-hmm. The goal that we conceded against Ghana in the final group stage game is um, an, a sort of aging Reyna. This is his fourth sort of World stumbles. Cup. It was his fourth, fourth World, World Cup. Cup. Mm-hmm. Yeah, stumbles and garnish, the ball mm-hmm. is stripped and away they go and score. Mm-hmm. So I think it was more just like, like Eddie Pope was uh, around was towards the end of uh, mm-hmm. his sort of national his, team. His third World Cup. Right. Same for McBride, yeah. Casey Keller in goal. Mm-hmm. His fourth World Cup. Right, it's a lot <laughs> yeah. of old guard <laughs> yeah. favorites. And right? I think at the time, the perspective on that was like, we've got this established veteran team, yeah. so you have that veteran core. Because I do remember at the time there was the big debate over like, do you take Taylor Twelman or do you take Brian mm-hmm. Ching? And the consensus ended up being like, ah, it doesn't matter because they're not going to start because you have all these other veterans who will. And then you look at it now with, you know, hindsight being 2020 and Captain Hindsight and all that good stuff, <laughs> and you think like, oh, wait, no, that was a problem. That if you have a really old center back and a really old holding midfielder, mm-hmm. uh, you know, not trying to be uh, – what, what, what with ages or anything like that, but you, you can't rely on that right. on, a, on a player who's advanced in age who has yep. a number of games under their belt to play three games in a short amount of time and still be a hundred percent for each and one. Don't expect to play any more games. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so my argument is that mm-hmm. that was a problem in two thousand six. It's a mm-hmm. kind of a problem any national team manager that goes through a couple of cycles. You have right. your favorites, right? right? It would have been Klinsmann's problem maybe in twenty eighteen if he'd, mm-hmm. if he'd been allowed to stick around. That's no longer a problem because those guys that he relied on that were too old mm-hmm. are now ten years older. They're mostly in their 40s. They're all in their 40s. Mm-hmm. So there's no way that he can select them again. Mm-hmm. He can't call up Rayner, Eddie Pope, or Casey Keller. They're all moved on to other things. Mm-hmm. So that problem is gone. Right. Now, what about the problem of throwing people under the bus? Oh, because this was also tweeted mm-hmm. to us. Um, so, yeah, because we'd mentioned we didn't like Klinsman throwing players under the bus. Mm-hmm. Um, we were sent um, a copy of an LA Times article where Bruce Arena does call out Landon Donovan, Demarcus Beasley, maybe one other player, was it Keller? Mm-hmm. After the... After the 3-0, I think, 3-0 defeat to the Czech Republic in the opening game mm-hmm. of the 2006 World Cup. The key thing is, though, that's pretty much, as I, as I understand it, the only time Bruce Arena did that as U.S. national team coach. And that would be the distinction for me because there's a difference between assigning blame and throwing people under the bus. Yes. And the consistent frustration for me amongst – well, not the, but one of the things that I was consistently frustrated by with Jurgen Klinsmann – was that there was never really a, I got this wrong. My tactics were wrong. I set us up to fail, which some coaches will tell you. A lot of coaches will do because they'll bite the bullet because they know they can. Uh It routinely was someone else didn't do this. Someone else didn't pick up that. This guy wasn't where we needed him to be. Oh, Mm -hmm. DeAndre is at a lower level. Like It just wasn't that level of accountability that you want. It was never, I failed to prepare them correctly. Right. Which I'm pretty sure is a lot of the problems recently. And I'm not saying that Bruce Arena every other time did that. I'm not saying that every single time it was, oh, it's my fault, it's my fault, except for this one game. I don't, actually, I don't think he's one to sort of take blame for himself. He'll focus it elsewhere. That's He'll fair. He'll deflect and, and protect his players. And if he does that again, if he throws people under the bus routinely, then I will be annoyed with him for it. Yeah. But in that situation, when you have just been destroyed by a team that you really needed to beat or get a draw against, mm-hmm. given the opposition that remained in that group... I can understand being frustrated and calling out, like, this guy was not aggressive enough. This guy didn't do what we need him to do. And you either you look for a reaction. You look for a reaction one of two ways. Either they fold and you don't play them, 
or they come back and get a result, which is what they did. Okay, so this is the key thing to me, the reaction part. I saw the Bruce Arena calling out Landon Donovan. You know those guys are tight, right? right? Um, I saw that as man management. I saw it as, and, and good man management isn't mm-hmm. that you consistently throw players under the bus whenever a little thing goes wrong. Right. But when you want some, some drastic change in form, you have blaming the players or calling out players in public. That's what it is basically, right? mm-hmm. calling out players in public in the press. That's like your nuclear option. If you want to motivate Landon Donovan, like hit the nitros on Landon Donovan, that's the thing you can do maybe one time mm-hmm. in the press. And if you watch that Italy game, USA v Italy, it finishes 1-1, there are three red cards. Landon Donovan is excellent in mm-hmm. that game. Yeah. He went out there and was everywhere and full of energy, like determined to prove a point. Mm-hmm. It's man management and it worked. Yeah. And I think that is the big, big thing we'll get with Bruce Arena that we didn't get with Klinsman is someone who figures out how to get the best out of players in a sort of emotional kind of way some players get the armor on the shoulder some players get maybe a bit of a slap yeah. some, some players get advice the different people need different things I, I'm going to bring up a, a different topic for a second and say I think it's probably one of our favorite coaching decisions that's ever been made when you and I have been doing the Total Soccer Show is the uh, it was Ranieri right who made the substitution took off De Rossi and Tati in the, mm-hmm. the Rome Derby because he and his explanation afterwards was it means too much to them. They're they are emotional. Roma through and through. They get yeah. too emotional in this game. They won that game, right? And, it, and they ended up winning once he made that substitution. Yeah. That's not throwing players under the bus. That is stating factually, this is why I made this change for these emotional reasons, and it had an impact, right? Yep. I don't think Tati and De Rossi were like, oh, man, that hurts my feelings that he did that. I don't really want to play for this guy anymore. No, they it's celebrate m- winning the Rome derby because exactly. it means so much to them. Exactly, and so I think <laughs> that's what I'm trying to get at is that you can have – pointed criticism for specific reasons and if it gets a reaction it does but you're explaining your actions yep. versus Jurgen it seemed like a 3-5-2 hadn't been practiced why do you think it didn't work in this game well Michael and Jermaine didn't do what we needed them to do yeah. that's a different thing they didn't get into their one on one battle it's not what, was, what right? do you think was wrong with Michael and Jermaine's game and then he answers that question yep. when you are jumping to something as a way of not answering the question about why you weren't prepared mm-hmm. that's throwing people under the bus I agree I 100% agree okay so this is this is turning into mm-hmm. the us making the case for Bruce Arena sure. and I'm kind of I'm on board with that here's the ultimate case for Bruce Arena when we you named some names earlier that were the alternatives mm-hmm. Um, you mentioned Vermees. Uh, I mentioned Pereja. A lot of mm-hmm. people mentioned Pereja. Jesse Marsh, Caleb Porter. Mm-hmm. You're talking about guys who have had some recent success success mm-hmm. in Major League Soccer. Right. But the most successful coach, I think, I haven't looked at these stats, but I think the most successful coach of the last few years is mm-hmm. Bruce Arena because right. he won three MLS Cups with LA Galaxy. Yeah. Right? Recently. Yeah. I mean, now my counter to that, which I know that you have a counter to that, would be that it is still LA, which is an incredibly attractive destination when you're recruiting players because, yeah. you know, again, people get mad at me when I do this. So I'll make up as, you know, if Duluth had an MLS team versus LA. You'd probably choose LA because it's like, ooh, that Minnesota in the winter? No, I'm good. I'm good. Please, uh, if you're emailing from Duluth, it's taylor at totalsoccershow.com. You no need to CC me. I'm fine. Fair enough. But you know, <laughs> but so I do think that there's that element to it and that LA has historically been a team that was okay with, with spending some money. Yeah. yeah. So there is that argument, though, that it's like, the, yeah, the, he managed he had, the, like, he had big money to play with. Yeah. 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 So how would you defend against that then? Because he's not going to be able to just go out and sign people. It's the joke about you know Big Sam. They didn't make the playoffs the year before he took over. There it was go. the Beckham experiment book the mm-hmm. year before Arena took over. Like at the LA thing, the Beckham experiment where mm-hmm. you spend big money and have like I want to call them a, the LA Galacticos type thing, right? <laughs> yeah. The DPs were brought in. That wasn't working. Bruce Arena made it work. The idea of Bruce Abel Arena, being a Galactico is hilarious to me, but I know what you mean. I know what you mean. He was yeah, in the early yeah, days, right? He was. But it was Arena that put together a team that had, yeah, Beckham, Donovan, Keane, made all that work together, mm-hmm. brought in Omar Gonzalez and AJ De La Garza and built that team. Also brought in the guys that held it together, right? Like Eddie Lewis and Chris Klein for a bit. Uh, mm-hmm. Greg Berhalter came in. Like he built an actual team at the LA Galaxy that was not there before. Yeah. He is a successful MLS coach. And not only that, it's the second time he's done it because the first time around, he built that DC team. That's what got him the US job in 1998. Mm-hmm. This is true. This is very true. You know, so I brushed over the New York Red Bulls period. Well, I think that the explanation <laughs> for that that I've seen pretty frequently is essentially that he took that job because he had been sort of humiliated and mm-hmm. his pride was pretty low. Yeah. And he wanted to show that it's like, no, I'm a really good coach. It was just, you know, an outlier. And so he took this job having not had a break for what MLS starts in 1996 before that he's coached UVA so who knows when his last break was so basically he was just burnt out is the general consensus then he takes a couple years off do you know what he did then he takes over at New York Red Bulls he he got Claudio Reyna as a DP 
That's so it's good. almost that like old loyalty to those guys. Oh is, boy, is still a problem. Well, now here's here's the number one. <laughs> uh, that aside, the number one thing that obviously people we've had lots of emails about it, we've had lots of tweets about it, and we probably have to discuss are his comments from 2013. And there oh, is this yes. idea of you could say they were misguided, you could say they were ill informed, up to racist or xenophobic, depending on how you want to see it. But this idea that. It's kind of like Americans need to be American is the way you could break it down. So this is the full quote. Mm -hmm. Um, It was given to um, Doug McIntyre, who Mm -hmm. still does a lot of really good US soccer reporting. That's only from 2013. Mm -hmm. um, To ESPN, the magazine. Bruce Arena said, players on the national team should be, and this is my own feeling, American. Mm -hmm. That's kind of an odd thing, right? Because we can pass that various ways. But the second part is... If they're all born in other countries, I don't think we can say we are making progress. Mm -hmm. I, at the time and now, take that to mean we need to develop players in this country and then put those guys in the national team because that means we have a system that works. Mm -hmm. If we are having to go out and supplement our team with guys who came up through the German system or whatever, then Mm -hmm. that means we are failing over here. I would even take it a step further than that and say... I feel like what he was getting it was not was not supplement, but primarily rely upon. Okay, that yeah. if we're going out and primary our primary way of getting good players is to recruit dual nationals who yeah. maybe have already played for Germany once or twice, but now maybe they're kind of on the outside looking in. So like we Fabian come in Johnson and say, and Jermaine hey, Jones, that's yeah, how we got those guys. Exactly, right? yeah. they had both already played for Germany multiple times. Yeah. Um, so I think that was more what he was getting at is like we shouldn't be relying on that. That should be a supplemental thing that, hey, there is this guy. Hey, there is that guy. Right. That said, he was a coach in Major League Soccer at the time. He has a vested interest in growing the league and the league getting better and get more eyes getting on the league. Yeah. And I do think that informs that as well, that he's basically trying to say we need to grow our domestic league because that is the future of the national team. Yeah. Now – all of that said, I think he said it about as poorly as you could, and yeah. a national team manager has to be smarter than that. Well, the first part of that quote, players on the national team should be, and this is my own feeling, American. Mm-hmm. The obvious implication you can take from that is that the mm-hmm. guys, the German-American guys are not American, mm-hmm. right? This is very much like a Sarah Palin, real America yeah. thing. I don't really think he meant that intensely, intently, mm-hmm. intentionally. Yeah, there you <laughs> um, go. You got there. But there is that implication, right? And that's what worries me. Yeah, but, because even if it's not something he really believes, you have got to be smart. You've got to know what your sound bites are going to be. Mm -hmm. And even if you then spend 20 minutes explaining what you meant by that and how you didn't mean to offend and how it was like that, you know the headline is going to be, Bruce Arena says America for Americans, and it's going to be (laughs) taken out of context or in context because it kind of was. So it was raised recently Mm -hmm. in his his press conference on Tuesday. Yeah, he walked that one back as much as you can walk something back. He absolutely did, right? Um, He essentially said that like as long as they have a passport – um, and they are committed to the team mm-hmm. like I want them. He also, and I think this was the very smart thing to do, was to reference the fact that one of his key players in, what, 2002 mm-hmm. was Ernie Stewart. And, uh, yeah, and then I think stuck with David Regi, didn't he? Yeah, stuck so, with David Regi. Yeah, I mean, that's another um, one. Mastroeni, I think, was born abroad. There are a lot of, like, players from um, overseas that Arena selected and continued to select. Mm-hmm. So I think any any idea that he would only choose american born players and not guys that were like from military families overseas mm-hmm. is there's no there's no basis in fact to back that up right no i mean you can still say that like it's not going to help it's not going to help get potential dual nationals to choose to play for the united states yeah it's not going to get the guys who already have made that decision to be particularly pumped when you see that quote from your current coach that is true mm-hmm. right but and there's, spe- there's no way he selects a roster to play honduras in march that doesn't have fabian johnson for example. No. I, right? yeah, no, so I, I just want to make sure that everybody knows that that is not what we're talking about here. That's no, not a possibility. But, but I think, again, when he made those comments, it was kind of with the background of, I'm the Galaxy coach, mm-hmm. I want this league to be better. Yeah. So you do have to wonder if he still has an interest in promoting Major League Soccer yeah. and therefore is going to kind of look to the domestic yeah. league. And then I think the, the weird thing that we really haven't talked about very much at all, I think mainly because we didn't know it existed, is the, I guess, increasingly reported upon story that there's a kind of division in the locker room a little bit, that a lot of the German-American, the guys who speak German on the U.S. national team tend to hang out together, tend to be a little bit more like, uh, what's the word I'm looking for here? Well, like, not withdrawn, but like sort of they don't try to kind of participate as much that they kind of stick with the guys because I think if you're a native German speaker, it's easier to speak German. Yeah, and I I I think this is another thing that needs to be made clear as well. As we understand it, 
there's not an actual division, right? Right, where the German Americans are all like staring at the American board players across the room, being like, "Oh, you guys are terrible." They actually put on their German, t- like their German track suits when they yeah, leave. Yeah, they're not singing no. Deutschland über alles in the in the locker room. That'd it's be no- real weird. It's nothing like that. It's just that natural thing mm-hmm. where you drift towards the people that you know, and also the people that you know have a shared experience that you have, mm-hmm. right? So it's not like there's some problem with patriotism or problem with commitment to the team maybe Timmy Chandler the way he was in and out a little bit mm. but no problem with like Jermaine Jones or Fabian Johnson not caring enough yeah right I mean it, it's essentially the opposite side of you've the you've seen coin. Jermaine Jones play right yeah <laughs> but it's but it's the opposite side of the coin to what we've been experiencing which is you have the um the Abby Wombat comments about how like guys like it, yeah like that Klinsman is favoring dual nationals because he himself is a dual national yeah. that like that's that part of it that if you have this coach who's who's intentionally bringing in people who wants to look abroad and not look at the domestic league yeah. that's a problem now you're seeing the flip side to that from the opposite side of the spectrum which is well now you have this guy who doesn't want to bring in people from abroad who doesn't want to be inclusive right okay so let's talk about that flip mm-hmm. side then first of all i don't think there's going to be a thing where arena will refuse to call up german americans mm-hmm. or guys overseas but there is a thing where his knowledge base mm-hmm. is heavily mls focused right he's worked in the league for the last eight mm-hmm. years he worked in the league before that mm-hmm. he knows mls inside out mm-hmm. i want to say he does not know the bundesliga the eredivisie even half as well as Jurgen Klinsmann does. So is there a natural bias where there may be some like up-and-coming left-back for Stuttgart mm-hmm. that he just won't know about that Klinsmann would have, but there is some maybe not as good up-and-coming left-back for Dallas that Arena does know about? Yeah, I mean, that's a distinct possibility, and that's why I was saying with some of like the Bielsa's, for example, they, if, if you hired Bielsa, he has to get used to MLS. He has to watch, and yeah. you're now, there's, what, three games left in Major League Soccer, and then you're out for the rest of the season because right. you've got the two second legs of the conference finals. Oh, so and he doesn't the final. get a chance to watch half the players play before. Right, so he's got to get used to that, then he's got to get used to the Americans abroad. Bruce Arena, what I'm saying is, like, already has that familiarity with MLS, so he can spend November, December, whenever in Europe. He's going to get some air miles. Yeah. The, the, the <laughs> big difference, though, I would say, which is something that when we talked about the pros of Klinsman, I think we hit upon a little bit, but I'm realizing now is a big difference, is that when you have Bruce Arena, say he wants to go watch Julian Green for Bayern Munich. Yep. He's the head, of the head coach of the U.S. national team. Oh, we have the head coach from the U.S. national team here. Bayern Munich is a bad example for this. When he wants to go watch Christian Pulisic play, he's the head coach okay. of the U.S. national team. Whereas when it's Jurgen Klinsman... It's head coach of the U.S. national team and also Jurgen Klinsmann. So he, people, I think, are going to be a little bit more excited. They know him. He's an internationally known guy. You mean like the welcome he'll get at yeah. the stadium. So yeah. it's sort of like, yeah, people are going to want to pay attention to him a little bit more. He has that clout mm-hmm. around the world, I think. It's also easier for Klinsmann to arrange that, right? Mm-hmm. I imagine he has a network with someone he can call well, at most yeah, clubs. But I could see, I mean, like uh, in Liga Mekis, say he wants yeah. to go watch somebody play and for Cruz Azul or whomever. Yeah. Like, Cruz Azul players or you know owners or whomever probably know Jurgen Klinsmann from back in the day. They remember watching him in the World Cup or mm-hmm. watching him play for for any number of his clubs. And so there's probably a little bit of like, oh, cool, like we'll get to meet Jurgen Klinsmann. <laughs> I don't know if they're that pumped to, to meet Bruce Arena, especially given gonna, you know not, they're not going to not give him tickets, right? No, 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 oh, no, 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 not at all. But I just think like that Unless level. Unless there's a game against Mexico coming up. True. But that <laughs> level of influence, that sort of level of clout, I yeah. think, isn't quite the same. And that is something that, like, it makes it more attractive to go meet the head of the U.S. national team yeah. if you're a dual national because it's Jurgen versus Bruce. But I'd take that trade off for someone who's going to set the team up this um, is true. a bit more sensibly. This is very <laughs> with, true. And mm-hmm. with uh, yeah. more instructions. Yeah. Uh, one thing, like a narrative to be maybe concerned about, but maybe we should warn listeners about going forward, is Arena's first roster will be a January camp roster. Mm-hmm. The, the games haven't been announced, but there will be games against, what, like probably Canada, Norway, Japan, Iceland, one of those, something like that yeah. in January. The roster will be domestic only because MLS will be out of season, Europe will be in season. So it's going gonna, it's gonna to weirdly look like he favours MLS players yeah. with his first roster because there'll be no European players there. Dom- domestic only with a caveat of team players that play in leagues that are out of season yeah okay, so you yeah. might get maybe like uh is it horvath is that molda yeah. right and like maybe josh gat if he's fit right. because they'll be out of season you can get them in right. you're not messing anything up i'm just already seeing that on like <laughs> i was gonna say fake news sites <laughs> but you know what i'm saying like, yeah. like, you, you're gonna get that story put out there that uh, brad arena sorry mm-hmm. chooses I went you got backwards. there eventually yeah. I went backwards to the u.s coaches <laughs> um arena chooses mls only roster mm-hmm. or domestic heavy roster i think you are gonna get that because I think what he is going to do is make a few statement selections. Interesting. So I won't be surprised if you get some of those names that haven't been 
included. I bet you're going to get like a Darlington Nagby. I yeah. bet you're going to get probably a Benny Failhaber. Uh, I mean, who, who else Did you is see there? Benny Failhaber's response oh, to just the smiling fight. emoticon. Yeah, yeah it was the or, laughing emoji. Yeah, it was. You're right. <laughs> or emoji. Uh, Dax who, McCarty. Dax McCarty would be the other big yeah. one. Yeah. So I won't be surprised if any of them are in there. Maybe Breck Shea. I mean, like Breck Shea was a guy who I think Bob Bradley gave his first cap to. So I could be wrong on that one. Can't but remember, but, yeah. but I think you're going to see some of those names in there as a way of saying. Fresh start, everyone's back, everyone yep. is in consideration. I don't want to get too much into speculating on that roster yet because we'll actually get to talk about it within a month-ish mm-hmm. or so. But I want to say Sebastian Legette, Robbie Rogers, a lot of yep. guys like that. <laughs> Alan Gordon. I mean, Alan Gordon was on the roster for the Mexico-Costa Rica game. I mean, and the question that we've gotten a lot that I know a lot of people <laughs> have discussed and have asked Bruce Arena is Landon Donovan. And yeah. he did not close the door on that. So what he said was, well, he, I mean, he gave a very sensible answer. Mm-hmm. I will say, apart from that, players on the national team should be American, quote, mm-hmm. he's been very savvy yep. this time around with all the press conferences. I'll bet David, uh, is it cameraman, has been uh, yeah. helping prepare him for this. Yeah. He said, Landon Donovan doesn't even know if he's going to retire or yep. play soccer for the LA Galaxy next season. Yeah, so he's got to resolve that first. Yeah, so we'll think about national team after he thinks about whether he's going to play soccer or not. Mm-hmm. Remember, Arena was not thrilled with Donovan's decision to um, take the year off and go to Cambodia and all that sort of That's stuff. That's right. He yeah. wasn't thrilled about it at all. No. He made sure that he, he was not paid his wage during that time. That's right. Yeah, the I focus was on that. Klinsman, but Arena was not thrilled about it. Because yes. obviously it affects him more. Yeah. Because right? yeah. he needed him every weekend. That makes sense. <laughs> I can't remember. I feel like I have a vague memory of this. Did Donovan end up getting his like farewell game? With the U.S. national team? I think yes, he did, right? because I remember a very awkward handshake. Yeah. Like, as he came off. Yeah. Okay, so then it wouldn't even be needed for that. Like, it wouldn't no. be, let's bring him back for one more game just to, like, get him a proper goodbye. But Arena is the guy that gave Miola a 100th cap, like, long after he'd stopped playing for the U.S. national team. This is true. So it would, that wouldn't surprise me. All right. All right. So we shall see. <laughs> we shall see. So I guess for all of those reasons, we are happy to have Bruce Arena in charge. Yeah. But, I mean, we definitely have... Reasons for trepidation, Mm -hmm. reasons for rational concern, but definitely not disappointment and definitely not, well, now we're going to win the World Cup. Right. (laughs) But at least now we've got a good chance of going to the World Cup. I will Mm -hmm. say this. He was the best choice for someone to come in two games down in the hex and get us to the World Cup. And that's another point that I think you were making off air that I think is very important. And I know we've talked about this a lot, but I really want to get this point home is that many Many people, myself very much included, cannot remember a time when the United States wasn't in the World Cup. 1986. Right. That's why. Yeah. I, mean, I was two. Right. <laughs> I mean, yeah, and I was six in 1990. Not even going to try to claim that I remember any of that World Cup. Right. Um, and so I think it does become an element of like, oh, we're going to make it. Like, it's not, come on, let's be real here. Like, we're going to make the World Cup. Yeah. It would be a disaster. Oh, three and a half teams go. And I, I think that's a lot of people calling for Bielsa. And like, you, have you seen Bielsa like walk in and out of Marseille and various other teams? Lazio. Quit after Lazio. Like, however long. <laughs> yeah. You don't want to become a revolving door thing um, and stumble your way through the next few hex games and then suddenly you're not qualified. It is an actual possibility the U.S. does not qualify for a World Cup just because it hasn't happened in your lifetime. Mm-hmm. And so- soccer is, in America right now, soccer is a very sort of... Uh, it is a game that is supported a lot by people in their 20s and 30s right now. Yeah. Right? And these are people who will not have seen the U.S. fail to qualify for a World Cup. I've seen my team do it. Mm-hmm. I've seen England fail to get to the USA 94 World Cup. I've seen England fail to go to Euro 2008. It is heartbreaking. And that's, and that's the thing is because I know there are people who would say, I would rather bring in an exciting manager and try to kickstart and get the U.S. to this next level. And if you fail and you miss the World Cup, then you rebuild from there. I think that that is easily said if you have never not made the World Cup, right? right? You do not know what it feels like. But I remember, I mean, I think we we weren't even friends when uh, England didn't make 2008. But I remember having friends who were huge England fans Mm -hmm. who were devastated. And it felt weird. It felt weird to not have England in those 2008 Euros, which I think by then we were friends, which is weird. I think we may have met afterwards. We played soccer for Richmond City that summer. Yeah, it would have been that summer. Yeah, Yeah. so so, I mean, it's... It's not worth it, in my opinion. Uh-huh. And it's not worth taking for granted that the United States is going to qualify. It, it is far more detrimental to the program to not make it than to make it and not play well. More so in the U.S. than in England as mm-hmm. well, right? England doesn't need any more soccer fans. Mm-hmm. It doesn't need any more young people playing football. Mm-hmm. The USA needs the World Cup every four years to have people tune in because it's the Olympics. Like They watch soccer the way I will maybe watch sprinting mm-hmm. once every four years yeah. and be like, 
oh, I actually like this. And yeah. then they go watch their MLS team. And then there's like US, the US has new fans. And maybe some kid starts playing soccer and he's the next Christian Pulisic, right? Mm-hmm. It is very important, not just from a heartbreak, emotional kind of way, but for the long-term growth of soccer in America. Yeah. The US gets to the 2018 World Cup. Absolutely. Bruce Arena is the best choice to get us there. Exactly, exactly. So yes, there were other options that could have been exciting. Yes, it would have been cool to see Steve Chirondolo come back and suddenly take over the U.S. national team <laughs> because I love Steve Chirondolo, but he, he not be, right now. Maybe an assistant coach. Might, could be. <laughs> All right, we should definitely move on from Bruce Arena. Let's do it. Because we've got MLS playoff games to talk about. Mm-hmm. But first, we should talk about Bruce Arena's boss. <laughs> this is the yeah. other guy. Um, this is actually another Twitter thing. And I realize Twitter is not the whole world, but mm-hmm. it is a place to... Um, sample a lot of opinions in one place, right? Internet when, chamber, sure. When, <laughs> when Arena uh, was announced, yep. the tweet was from US Soccer's Twitter mm-hmm. account. Um, it was that at Sunil Galati has named Bruce Arena as the new coach. Mm-hmm. And so when people replied to that tweet, a lot of people were asking, like the people who were saying this is a step backwards, I don't mm-hmm. like this, were saying, um, how can we fire Sunil Galati? Right. And again, I think this might be the fifth time we've answered this on this show. You can't fire Sunil Galati. He is an elected official. Mm-hmm. He is elected by the uh, what the board, the executive board yep. um, of U.S. Soccer. His term goes until 2018, where he will stand for election again, more than likely. And do you know who is keenly aware that he has to stand for election again? Sunil Galati. Really? And I think this is my just conspiracy theory speculation. Yeah. Who has leaked the negative stuff already? Which side, Klinsman or U.S. Soccer? U.S. Soccer. It's been U.S. soccer. Uh-huh. And I think that that I'd is... i say that's because they have more of it to leak. <laughs> probably. But I think it's not a coincidence. I think Sunil Galati is keenly aware that everyone knows that this was his man, that he chased after uh, they fired Bruce Arena in 2006, 2007. That it 2006, was 2006 was after the World Cup. With, yeah. It was with the idea that it would be... Clinton's been taking over yeah. after he had just done wonders with Germany. That's why Bob Bradley was interim manager for right. more than a little while. It's because mm-hmm. they were waiting for Klinsman to come along. And yeah. so when he finally gets him, there's this idea like he's got his man, technical director, it's all yeah. going to go great. This is Sunil's plan. And it's it, happening. And it hasn't. And that's obvious. And I think you're starting to see those stories of like, oh, actually, they wanted to fire him a long time ago. Mm-hmm. That may absolutely be true. But I think it's U.S. soccer trying to or U.S. Soccer or Sunil Galati as U.S. Soccer saying like, no, see, we knew the whole time. We knew. We knew we made these changes. We were on top of it. So that it may be come that election, he can say like, no, I, I made the tough decisions. I was aware of it all along. We have a new coach. We got to the World Cup. Things are great, right? Elect me again. Because he needs to yeah. stay there. I mean, he needs to stay there for him because he's got the position in FIFA, because yeah. he has that standing. But I think that is part of the reason why you're hearing these stories now. There's also... Um there's an idea that who else who would replace him? Because I think the last couple of elections he's run unopposed, right? Mm-hmm. There's no alternative candidate to Sunil Galati. Daryl Grove. I already <laughs> proposed you for the US national team. I'm not, not a citizen. <laughs> we gotta rectify that. Have I moved on from being capable of playing and now I have to be in an admin position? Yeah, but I mean I, I, I don't <laughs> well, first of all, I'm okay with you becoming a citizen and becoming uh, the head of U.S. soccer. Why not? But, I mean, that's, to oh, me, that's not I, a great... I guarantee I'll be a citizen by 2020. Let's put it that way. By November Fair. 2020. I'm not saying that Senor Galati is a dictator, but I think you've just rationalized the justification for every dictator ever staying in power. It's like, there's nobody else you want that you know right away who could totally defeat me, otherwise I'll oh, kill them. To, like, <laughs> to give credit to Galati, he is the one that's proposing term limits yep. on the U.S. soccer presidency Fair. as well. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure when those term limits would come in. After he's no longer in <laughs> charge. No, I'm sure not. But, yeah, I just think, like, you're right. I can't name anybody now, but that's mm-hmm. because I have not looked into the, the machinations yeah. of U.S. soccer. I think the thing I would say is, okay, yeah, Sunil Galati is not perfect, especially the Klinsman gamble has not paid off, right, you would mm-hmm. argue. Um, but there are definitely federations in worse shape. Like, look at Argentina, um, where how upset Leo Messi was. Like, yep. he basically retired to try and force some change at the Argentina Federation, yeah. right? There are places in disarray. At yeah, least, I mean, at least, at least Sino Galati makes the trains run on yeah, time. Yeah, you could be a federation who, like, appointed somebody and then they had to be fired immediately because they were caught on tape saying stupid things. <laughs> <laughs> you could be talking about anyone. Uh, yeah, who knows? Who knows? <laughs> or Sam Allardyce. That's the one, chef. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, okay. All Shall right. we? Um, we'll soon talk MLS conference finals. Sure. But first, we should let everybody know that today's show is sponsored by Fuji. Mm-hmm. Fuji, the makers of the engineered soccer rebound. F U T C H I, because Daryl says things with a weird voice. <laughs> and sometimes I play Fuji dressed in a weird suit. Oh, boy. Yeah, so we did our, uh, our holiday themed uh, Fuji special. Yeah. Uh, The video of that will be out uh, in the very near future. In the next few hours. But it was us playing in Santa suits. Yep. 
And number one, difficult to keep the pillow in the belly. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> that was a pillow? That was your <laughs> yes. real belly? I, 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 went I, real, I went real method with it. Oh, yeah. I went full De Niro. I was <laughs> piling on pounds for like two months. Yeah. And then you dropped them all? <laughs> yeah. That's impressive. Again, full De Niro. That's very impressive. <laughs> but I, went, I went full De Niro, then full Christian Bale in The Machinist. I'm going to assume that was wind assisted, which is to say that <laughs> you just did a lot of drugs that helped you lose that weight. Um, but I, like, we had some people stop and look at us yeah, we curiously. Did. We had a few people take photos of us playing South yeah. Carolina Santa costumes. It's interesting. Um, judge of it's an interesting like litmus test for character right the people who look at you like you're insane and are scared of you yeah versus the people who like wave because they know it's funny or yeah I think I didn't, I think I didn't help with that <laughs> why because I was the one with the with the fake beard on top of the real beard who would see people <laughs> looking at us from a distance and yeah. just like scream hi and like wave to them like I was I was really embracing the idea of being a lunatic I think you were the more Dan Aykroyd in Trading Places Santa I've never seen Trading two. Places oh. I, I hate to break this to you oh what you, because you made that reference while we were playing because we did uh, <laughs> holiday terminology. Yeah, so one of the challenges we set ourselves. So, yep. again, if you haven't seen Fuji, you probably, if you're a regular TSS listener, mm-hmm. you should know about Fuji by now. It is a rebounder net with a court in front of it. And you essentially play like squash or racquetball. Not sure what they call it in this country. Um, and you play the ball against the net, land it in the court. Your opponent does the same. If you fail to do it, you miss the net or you, it goes out the court you lose the point. Mm-hmm. Um, that's how Fuji works. Yeah. We set ourselves a challenge of not only wearing a fake beard and a fake belly um, and a full Santa suit and a hat. <laughs> there it is, thank while you. we did this. <laughs> um, I like all- the idea that our idea of Santa is just a pillow on your belly and a beard. <laughs> and we did everything else too, yeah. We also tried to put each other off by shouting random Christmas-themed things mm-hmm. like the Pogues virtu- featuring Kirsty McCarr. I believe that's one of yours. As we, as we struck the net. Mm-hmm. And I realized the big downside to my strategy was that I was going through all of uh, Santa's reindeer Deer. Yeah. And then you immediately acknowledged that you did not know any of the reindeer. I know and a couple. I, and I really could have just kept going and Don named. Don Blitzen. There you go. Yeah. Can you keep going? Rudolph. There you go. You got three. There you go. <laughs> okay. But I feel like I could have kept naming random things and yeah. just insisted they were reindeer names and you would have had to let it go. <laughs> See, then I would have started laughing, which is ultimately the goal, right? To put the other person off. Yeah. You would have been like... Uh, Wilson. John- <laughs> you would have been like John Mulaney to, uh, to my uh, Bill Hader doing yeah. Stefan on SNL, <laughs> where he used to like, insert random things yeah. to make him laugh. I think I did that a couple of different times. <laughs> so, um, a holiday Fuji, which I feel like you have to see. Mm-hmm. I haven't seen the footage yet, but I feel like other people have to see, even if we're I'm embarrassed. I'm scared. <laughs> um, I'm real scared. Um, the link will be in the show notes as soon as it's available, but it will go to youtube.com slash Total Soccer Show. Mm-hmm. YouTube.com slash Total Soccer Show. But the reason we did this isn't that we like dressing like Santa and playing soccer, although it was kind of fun. Mm-hmm. Um, it was because it's a Fuji holiday uh, special, which is the Black Friday discount. Yep. So if you go to playfuji.com, playfuji.com, and input the code Black Friday 2016, capital B, capital F, Black Friday 2016, from November 25th to November 28th, you will get $25 off the usual retail price. That's Black are. Friday 2016, capital B, capital F. And final thing that I've learned from this, I'm sure Santa's suit is slightly higher quality than the ones that we bought for $9 off of Amazon, but I have to say... I can't imagine it's that breathable for the big guy. So if you're leaving milk and cookies out, leave a bottle of water because he, he has to hydrate. Those Santa things are hydrate. hot. <laughs> you get real hot in there real fast. So <laughs> milk, cookies, bottle of water. <laughs> I'm sure he wouldn't mind a Pellegrino, but, you know, right, tap will do. Don't break the bank for Santa. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you to Fuji for uh-huh. sponsoring today's episode. We also watched the two MLS conference final that we did. first legs. We'll go uh, chronological order. First up, later than advertised, mm-hmm. was Montreal versus Toronto. I, I, yeah, and see, later than advertised because uh, I still don't even know the proper terminology, I guess, because there's two different things. But essentially, the 18-yard box was not quite 18 yards. <laughs> and that's what it needs to be for it to be, you know, an official soccer match. So the uh, I think it was 8.08 p.m. was the officially scheduled kickoff. Mm-hmm. Um, there was a delay, I think, of about half an hour mm-hmm. um, as they redrew the area and then painted over it so that the uh, the field was regulation. Uh, part of the reason for this is that the game was moved, right? Mm-hmm. It was moved to the Olymp- I think it's called the Olympic Stadium yep. in Montreal because they knew like this there's was... some proper like yeah. Quebecois and they're like Stadion Olympique. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, the Olympic Stadium. Because this was a big game, I think 50 or 60,000 people were there to mm-hmm. watch. 61, I believe. Wow, 1,000. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> 61 people total, yes. <laughs> to see Montreal versus Toronto. It finished 3-2 to Montreal. Montreal went into a 3-0 lead. Two goals in the first half, one in the second. It looked like they got this whole thing in the mm-hmm. back, right? But then two goal, a two-goal comeback for Toronto. 3-2, two, two away goals means all they need is a 1-0 win mm-hmm. or a 2-1 win mm-hmm. um, in Toronto next week. And they go through to MLS Cup. These, these are facts. The big thing I saw was all about Michael Bradley mm-hmm. for this game. I think because people care more about the U.S. national team than about two Canadian MLS teams. Nah, uh, somewhat. I think. Yeah. I think the fans At least of this side of the border. I think those those fans do. I'm sure lots of people do. I think for purposes of some of the debates you and I have been having and mm-hmm. the responses we've been getting, there were people who were making a case for why Michael Bradley is terrible. Oh, is yeah, basically. B- because we've already started this mm-hmm. conversation. That's why we were getting those. Yeah. yeah. The, the app Total Soccer Show is not all of Twitter. No, <laughs> probably not. Probably not. And we've established all of Twitter is not all of the world. So, you know, <laughs> so fractions on deliver, fractions. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but Michael Bradley, not great defensive work on at least two of Montreal's three goals. True. Is that fair to say? Yes, Okay, it is. So why don't we make the case for Michael Bradley can't defend? Okay. I mean, I I feel like that's a slightly biased uh, debate question, (laughs) but sure. I mean, it's essentially basically you can see... His defensive effort is enough that we were wondering if maybe he's just not fast anymore. Yeah. Uh, Because you never see him really at a, or very rarely see him at a full sprint. It seems to be a lot of that sort of Michael Bradley, like, upright jog that he does. (laughs) It's the best way, kind of chest out jog. Yeah. It reminds me of uh, Michael Johnson, I believe it was, the sprinter with the gold shoes who would lean all the way back. It's a little bit like that, only he is way slower. Um, So on the first goal for Domodoro, it's Bradley. Maybe could have closed down. Uh, who is it? Bernier. Uh, Bernier, thank you. Yeah. Maybe could have closed down Bernier harder, gotten to him, not let that pass come through. That said, Bernier plays it very quickly without looking. So yeah. it's kind of impressive. But still, it's that kind of slow, slowness, slow jog to close down space. And then for the third goal, it's basically uh, Ambrose Yango breaking through the left back for Montreal, yeah. dribbling 60 yards and eventually getting a shot off. In a straight line, more or less, right? And that one is the more damning of the two. Because you see Bradley just jogging slowly behind him as he's burst past, right? It, well, he's jogging. He's like jogging with pace. He's going like, you know, like when you're doing warm-ups, like 70% speed. Yep. He's going 70, I'd say. <laughs> and then within three seconds of that, he's going 20. Because right. Iunga then like gets... Bradley off screen, and Bradley stays off screen right up until Leongo shoots the ball. So he is clearly not working that hard to get back. Yeah. So that would be the argument against Bradley's defensive effort overall. The, well, the extra part I would add to this is the first goal, which is uh, Bernier receives the ball essentially mm-hmm. between the lines, right, yep. of Toronto's back three and Toronto's midfield. Mm-hmm. Bradley is the deeper of the three midfielders. Right. He is in the defensive midfield spot with, what, Osorio and Cooper ahead of him. Mm-hmm. Um, and Bernier has got behind Michael Bradley... Um, in front of Toronto's uh, central defenders, and Bradley hasn't managed to close him down at all. So I would almost blame him positionally for not cutting off the angle or marking Bernier. Okay, and here is where I disagree. Okay. Um, and I know that there are going to be people who say that I'm a Michael Bradley apologist or whatever. Yeah. For, I really don't care. I really do not care about Michael Bradley. He is not my favorite U.S. men's national team player. I think he's done a lot of good for the program. You don't care as you don't like him or you're just not, you're not passionately defending him like you're biased towards him. Is that what yeah, you're either yeah. way. Okay. Like, I mean, I like having Michael Bradley in the team. I like a lot of the different stuff, like the rainbow arm brand, armband I was yes. a big fan of. But he is not my favorite player. He is not a player that I think has to be there. Otherwise, we're in a lot of trouble. Mm-hmm. I think you think he's more that player than I do. I'd be scared if he wasn't starting, yeah. But I think you were, you said he was playing like the defensive midfield position. Yes. I don't think he had the defensive midfield role is the weird thing. Okay. Um, and I think Matt Doyle actually, I messaged him about this because I wanted to know his opinion. Yeah, yeah. And he basically said that Michael Bradley is doing a less sophisticated version of what Andrea Pirlo did for Juventus, which is he's in that spot yes. and it's deep lying, but I don't think he really has any defensive responsibilities. So it's more about the passing, more about starting things from back there yeah. and less about being Kyle Beckerman or yeah. uh, N'Golo Conte mm-hmm. and shutting things down. And so when you watch it through that lens, I really do think that it's sort of like he is, at least for that first one, it's like, so yeah, like they run, like Bernier runs like beyond him and then he does kind of move to close him down. But I think the reason why Bernier moves beyond him is because Michael Bradley isn't looking at him at all. He's paying attention to where the ball is and where he's, he is in relation to the ball. Mm-hmm. And I think that's what he has been instructed to do. It's yeah. kind of keep that central position, make sure that you're there so if we win possession back, you can then distri- distribute from the cent- center. But you're also there to break a play if it comes right through the middle. Yeah. But his job isn't to track or move and block space. I think it's to stay central. And that's why I think he's not there. Then he tries to close. And that is, to me, that's a deficiency in Toronto's game plan agreed because then you have a guy who is in that number six position but not doing a defensive job Mm -hmm. you are vulnerable especially against Montreal where 
every pre- preview I read said they will move around, they will make space, they'll be difficult to track, mm-hmm. right? And yeah. So that is essentially what happened for that goal because Bernier found the space and played it onto <laughs> what's his Twitter handle? Freaky fast. Freaky fast eight. <laughs> Dominic yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah. Who we have some love for because he's oh, he's VCU, right? VCU. Yeah, yep. he spent yep. Yep. four years in Richmond. VCU and. Accra, Ghana, I think. Yes, I think he's from the capital of Ghana. Yeah. Uh-huh. Um, I mean, and it's a really good finish from him. And it's it's some, it's a really nice finish. It's a good finish. And then it's a decent finish for Montreal's three goals. <laughs> uh, because Aduro's is a nice one. It's that breakaway. He slots it home from a tight angle. Yep. Uh, the second one would be uh, Mancosu finishing, yes. I think, we think an intentional ball from Piatti, but we're yeah, not sure. I thought it was accidental to begin with. Mm-hmm. On the replay, I thought, okay, yeah, he's right. Nice. And also, it's Piatti. Yeah, there's that. Yeah, he's he's pretty good. That third goal, and again, this is one where I think that even if it is Bradley is just trying to hold space, it's pretty poor that he doesn't really help to get back. And he does, and even at that point, because at first I thought it was sort of like, oh, there are five defenders back there, and he sort of is like, oh no, I'll hold my shape. Yeah. When we win the ball back, I'll be there as the outlet. It's it's three on three. It's three on three, and that's where I think he probably should have been working harder. Yeah. And that's something where I think even if the coach has said stay central. When you do that quick survey and it's three on three, you know you better work harder. So if you're going to make the case for him, is it that like he's hoping that maybe Drew Moore is in the tackle and Youngo, the ball's going to pop loose and that me, Michael Bradley, can collect the ball and play some beautiful like bending pass and get us going forward? Yeah, because I mean... That, what that, he should be doing is just running and closing him down and helping in the defensive yeah, effort. Yeah, but that yeah. happened. What you're talking about is it happened a couple times in the first half where he did kind of pull up in that pursuit, I think, mm-hmm. because number one, it's maybe not what he's been asked to do like aggressively run people down. Number yep. two, when you are making that kind of trailing tracking run, it's easy to knock up a guy's bet trailing leg, concede a foul, concede a free kick, maybe get a yellow card for it, and he thinks he's got people in front of him. And a couple yeah. different times, he leaves it for that central defender. It's usually Drew Moore who shows him one way and then wins the ball. That happened like two or three times in the yeah. first half. Yeah, so someone else does the dirty work mm-hmm. and he collects the ball and starts yeah. a passing move. This yeah. time, I think what happens is Embro Sayango takes sort of an, a heavy touch. So he dribbles in, takes it like a touch to the left where he's going to try to shoot. Yeah. But I think it's a little bit too far away. And so Drew Moore had good positioning, but because of that heavy touch... he was sh- shutting down that left mm-hmm. foot, right? He was yeah. showing him to the right, knowing that Anyonga can't shoot right. with his left foot. And then he right has foot. to kind of scramble to block off the shot, which mm-hmm. is basically then he gives up too much space and does allow Anyonga to shoot with his left foot and does put it back across goal, Whereas I, where I think Moore... And Toronto's goalkeeper, Irwin, Glenn Irwin, thought it was going near post. Yeah. So Irwin definitely cheats all the way to the right so that by the time Ayongo shoots that ball, all of his weight is on his right foot, his plant foot. And now he really can't transition and slide back across. And that's why it's a slow bouncing ball <laughs> into the side netting from 20, 25 yards out. And we could say if Bradley had sprinted, then... Drew Moore could have covered one side and Bradley could have covered the other. Then it's a lot harder Mm -hmm. for Anyonga to get that shot away. Even if he doesn't like knock him over, he at least closes down all Mm -hmm. the options. All right, so that's the case against Michael Bradley, the defensive effort. Um, Even if he's not instructed to, he still maybe could have put that extra effort Mm -hmm. in and shut some things down. He's kind of part of the... I don't say revolution, but he's part of the fight back mm-hmm. that gets it back to three Absolutely. two. And it's after it's basically after a change in shape, right? Doesn't yeah. Will Johnson come on? He does. After the third goal. And then Bradley suddenly isn't alone at the deep line role. He's got Will Johnson alongside of him. And I think Giovinco comes back mm-hmm. a little. You know, we haven't mentioned him yet because he hadn't really done anything up to this point. Mm-mm. And plays number ten. And then it's Ricketts and Altador up front. You got it. And all of a sudden, Toronto are back on. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, and you have from there you have Giovinco doing things because yes, he has do, that yeah. freedom. And you have Michael Bradley doing more Michael Bradley things of picking his head up and finding passes. And I think yep. that's because he ha- he does have Will Johnson alongside of him. So now, now he has a person who can do that actual defensive work yep. that allows him to really successfully do that kind of floating central midfield role. Yes. And that's why I think he's a little bit more successful with his passing, with his movement, with his vision in the second half. He scores, right? Yeah, Altidore scores second the first one. It's a little scrappy, then mm-hmm. a bit of magic from Giovinco, chip-headed yeah. Altidore header. Um, it's a great header from Josie Altidore. It's a great header. And then a really nice, I think it's side-footed finish into it the corner by Bradley. Does Altidore set him up? Ricketts sets him up, yeah? Altidore sets up Ricketts, and I think you could say sets him up by throwing somebody out of his way. <laughs> I can't remember who it is, but it's... it's a, number 30, I think it's Bernadello. Okay. You're the, but you're the Montreal midfielder. Yeah, it's basically... We've watched this a bunch of times, and I think our our end consensus is that it's probably a foul. <laughs> yeah, but you can understand why the referee didn't give it at the same time. Yeah. No, yeah. no. my take is it's probably a foul, but if you're Josie Altador and you are losing and you want to get a goal and you can get away with being that sort of aggressive mm-hmm. and not get a foul called on you, then go for it, Josie Well, that's Altidore. what I'm saying, but why, why can he get away with it? I don't know. Maybe it is because it's just not quite going over the line. Yeah, right? that, that's what I'm saying. Is yeah. I think it is like 
you could say it's like from the side. If you were going to justify it, I think the referee would say it was a it was kind of contact from the side after the defender had sort of overrun the ball because Josie Altador doesn't settle it well. It kind of runs through his legs, runs through the defender's legs. They both turn, and now you could then maybe say it's a 50-50 fight, yeah. and then Altador kind of puts a little <laughs> bit of pressure on. He makes it a 100-0 fight. Or the other argument would be that, yeah, he just shoves the guy in the back and throws him out of the <laughs> way. Awesome. Yeah. But I think what it is, I like seeing the passion and aggression from Altador because yeah. even, okay, he scored, Altador scores that first header to make it 3-1. Lawrence Simon is holding the ball. Altador rips it out of his hands and runs mm-hmm. back to the center circle like let's go get another one but even before that i can't remember who it is who eventually drops the ball back to giovinko who crosses it for altador but whoever it is uh he he basically fails to find josie in the first place he he like tries to shoot at the near post and Mm -hmm. it comes back to him you see josie get mad he does that sort of like exasperated like oh you should have played me the ball but then he very quickly resets and is like okay let's go again i think josie in years past is mentally out of it at that point Mm -hmm. and maybe not quite as up for the fight yes and those three incidents the shove the grab and the <laughs> reset are all signs that he is like mentally sharp and yeah. ready to go. All right, so goals from Altador and Bradley make yep. it 3 2. It's going to be a great game in Toronto next week, it right? It sure is. Because Montreal can always counter, that's always dangerous. Toronto need a goal but need to keep a clean sheet or at least need to not concede yeah. two goals to even up the away goal. And Toronto fans, if you don't have a TFO making fun of uh, field dimensions, then you're really missing your, uh, you're missing some low hanging fruit. <laughs> They should have a Tifo that uh, is the wrong shape. Yeah, that would that'd be the way to do it. <laughs> Might be too clever. But yeah. <laughs> All right, the other game of the night, the uh, the Western Conference final, was uh, Seattle Sounders hosting Colorado Rapids. Mm-hmm. Seattle got the home win. So essentially we have two home teams winning by one goal but conceding away goals. Mm-hmm. Um, who scores first here? Colorado score first? Yes. They do, don't they? It's a wonderful leave by Gashi. Gashi steps over. Former Wolves player Kevin Doyle gets the strike. Off of Chad Marshall mm-hmm. <laughs> and beyond the goalkeeper. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a. I think the tale of this goal is it's a good pass in. It's a good, quick attacking soccer from Colorado who basically collect a ball, play it around, quick passing. Jermaine Jones plays it in. It's a good dummy from Gashi. Yeah, and then it's. A, I she mean, it's a for good. All the world like Gashi's going to take that in stride, right? Yeah, instead he lets it run through his legs. And it's an opportun- opportunistic take from Doyle. It does go off Chad Marshall's. It looks like thigh, maybe a hand hip, in there. I'm not hip. sure. Yeah. Either way, it, it deflects and goes in. But, you know, them's the breaks. So, <laughs> such is life. And since we focus so much on Michael Bradley, mm-hmm. I want to say I enjoyed Jermaine Jones' performance mostly in this game. Mm-hmm. So that pass was a good example of a lot of the really good sort of um, incisive through balls he was playing. There's also one moment in the second half where he runs at full pelt backwards down the left wing, slides on his knees more or less, and chests the ball back to his left back. Mm-hmm. That's really great. <laughs> Even It's a thing that you spotted uh when we were watching the game together, and then when I read Matt Doyle's review of the game later on, he has like the the five second clip of this play where it's like the twenty second or twenty third minute. It's like two really really clever one touch passes from Jermaine Jones. Like one, I think he takes out of the air first time with the outside of his foot yes. and plays it like thirty yards in directly into one of his teammates, yeah. and that triggers an attack. Like it's that ability from Jermaine Jones, that technical ability and vision that is so impressive, and that does put him at that level where I think he will continue to be called by Bruce Arena. Yeah, absolutely. I think there will be moments when he'll miss those passes. But yeah. you see, when you see it He working, had those in this game, too. Yes, yeah. he did. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's the interesting one. Didn't um, Not to go back too much to Arena, but it is this, he's the man of the hour, right? Yeah. I think there was a question in the LA Times. They interviewed him mm-hmm. and, and asked him like... Boo the LA Times, boo. For other reasons, yeah. but yeah. Um, they asked him, uh, do you need to like refresh the roster or they make too many old players? Mm-hmm. And I think Arena's response as well, the only old names I see on the roster right now are Tim Howard... And Jermaine Jones, yep. what, like 37 and 35. Yep. Everybody else kind of young. Kind of young. Graham's is 30, but other than that, what else, what else is there to worry Clashton's about? Clashton's like 31, I think. But even so, speaking as a 32-year-old, 31 is young. <laughs> you feel that way now, right? You didn't feel that way seven years ago. That's correct. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like maybe that journalist was seven years ago. Who knows? Um, yeah, so, I mean, I think you'll continue to see him. And one player that I think we will definitely continue to see, and I hope we do, is Jordan Morris, because he scored the equalizer. He absolutely did. So, mm-hmm. Jordan Morris in this game, uh, Seattle played a sort of 4 2 3 one. Jordan Morris played like the left wing, left mm-hmm. attacking player, right, with Nelson Valdez. Um, at the top, the central striker mm-hmm. for Seattle. Um, Seattle's goal comes because Roldan, uh, Christian Roldan, um, sort of, I think, wins the ball, uh, dribbles a little bit, shoots from the top of the box. Jordan Morris is, when you watch this shot, Jordan Morris is making a run between defenders, hoping for a through ball, mm-hmm. maybe, right? Yeah. So that's what he's ready for. Instead, Roldan's shot hits the post, 
bounces back to Jordan Morris, who is not taken by surprise, but instead picks the perfect spot to beat Zach McMath. Yeah, I mean... Speaking because, of Tim Howard, Zach McMath in goal in place of the injured Tim Howard. Yeah, and I think Brad Friedel uh, was your color commentator for this game, was relatively quick to point out that he probably could have done better with this one because, McMath. again, it's a, it's a shot from distance, it's on the ground, and if he gets lower, if he does get a hand to it, he turns it out for a corner kick or turns it out for a throw-in True. or keeps it in play instead. He's a little late to react, a little slow to get down, and it hits off the post, and then he's already on the ground, which allows Jordan Morris to come in. And this is where it's, I think, a really good finish because McMath does try to get up really quickly and I think does what most people would do, which is it came off the near post, so I'm assuming you're now going to try to put it far post. What Jordan Morris does is essentially fire it sort of to the near post, but high enough that it's going to be over yeah. McMath, but low enough that it's not over the goal, which so would have been easy to do. He gave himself the best possible chance, right? Yep. Because not only does he put the ball in the direction that McMath is now starting to dive away from, mm-hmm. if McMath had stayed near post, he's still on the floor, so Jordan Morris yeah, lifts it over him. Yeah. So it's, it's and- kind of the perfect finish, given that he had to decide, like, like yeah. that, and if you're and if you're reading if you're reading a match report, I guarantee you at least one match report referred to this as a tap in, not a tap mm-hmm. in. It's a really difficult goal because you're reacting to it coming off the post quickly, which is always going to make a weird spin. You're also playing on turf, which isn't going to help things. Yeah, and I mean you're having to finish in a very like tight space under pressure. It's easy to put that out on if the you aim, If you aim for that for the far post, it might be saved. It might be put out for a goal kick or even a, even a throw in. We've seen that happen before. <laughs> so I think it's a really good finish from Jordan Morris. Does it make you excited about Morris? Mm, yes. The yeah. only thing that doesn't and i think this is what we have to do um so i know you're you're big into film if you watch a a quentin tarantino movie what's the one thing that you know is going to be in there swearing no aside from that violence yeah aside from that come on it's quentin tarantino i'm still right on both these things you are but what's the thing i'm referring to you know what i'm talking about tarantino cameo no it's feet you're gonna have a foot shot in there right and you know it no one is really excited for that you just know quentin tarantino seems to have a little tarantino is excited for that he's got a foot fetish yeah and so you know that's gonna be in there and you're just kind of like all right i know it's gonna be in here oh there it is okay let's move on did just accidentally list all the things that are definitely in a tarantino that's true that's true (laughs) fourth thing i think was there and so i think that we need to start like a non-cynical bingo game where it's just the one thing that you're just sort of like is going to make you otherwise be like ah. Oh. And for Jordan Morris, it's taking it with his right foot when he should have <laughs> gone with his left. For Jermaine Jones, it's like maybe one of those crazy Jermaine, like what are you doing overrunning that ball yeah. sort of sequences. I'm sure there's other ones for other players, but Jordan Morris has that in this game when he I think should absolutely shoot with his left and goes with the outside of his right yes. instead. I mean, isn't this, okay, to tie this again to the U.S. Mm-hmm. national team, you can also factor in, like, maybe Michael Bradley not putting in um, the correct defensive that, that would be one. That's, yeah. in the, that's in the bingo. But this is, like, if you're the U.S. national team coach, your job is to identify those weaknesses, mm-hmm. make sure they're not exploited, set up a team so that all the weaknesses are yep. negated and the strengths are amplified. Yep. And that's, again, that's what I think a practical coach like Arena can do. I promise that's the last time I'll go back to Bruce Arena. Mm-hmm. And so I'm going to bring it full Today. circle to say that <laughs> I think the only person who enjoys those Quentin Tarantino uh, foot moments are Jordan Morris as long as they're with the right foot. <laughs> <laughs> if it's a left foot, Jordan Morris has no uh, interest in it. He just covers half the screen. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, exactly. no, maybe he focuses on the left foot to, uh, to just to see what one looks like. That yeah, could be. <laughs> <laughs> and then, of course, we should probably mention that Seattle ended up winning this game, courtesy, oh, uh, courtesy of a penalty from Nico Ladero. So, else? yeah, Ladero um, wins the penalty mm. from Mark Birch, yep. I believe, e. um, scores the penalty himself, and also basically wins a personal battle with yep. Mark Birch that he started earlier in the game. Yeah, it's basically <laughs> there's like a, a foul's given, there's a loose ball that's sort of like they're both grappling for the ball to see who gets to take a free kick, even though only one of them can, because yep. I think it ends up being a throw in actually but in the scrum there Birch I guess if you're Nico Ladero throws an elbow throws a hand into the face if you're most other people you'd say that maybe there's a little bit of contact but Ladero seems to have tried to sell that yeah, one yeah Ladero holds his own face and like collapses to the floor mm-hmm. as if he's been like shot in the face like yeah. he's a friend of Dick Cheney's yes. right? that's not how <laughs> That's not what happened Top at all. But yeah, yeah it's, a, it's a great like 2007 joke. Maybe. <laughs> it predates the Dallas Hockey Show. It does. It absolutely does. I like to think that you had that one chambered at the time. You're like, man, I hope I get to do a soccer show 10 years from now. 
<laughs> I had to bring that one up. Chinese. No, I'm not even going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, yeah, that rivalry starts. I noticed that Mark Birch wearing um, a necklace. At that that time. seems like it shouldn't be allowed. That was odd, right? Mm-hmm. But we play um, in our local league here. You're not allowed to wear necklaces. You sure are. You will be told to take that off. Yeah, and I'm not. And sure, I don't know how he wasn't told that. Yeah, maybe that. Maybe that was the soccer gods punishing him. They're like, oh, you're still going to wear that necklace? <laughs> well, then you're going to concede a PK. <laughs> um, and we watched that one as well. So yeah. we watched the the slapping incident. I think we would say Birch does get a yellow card for that. So maybe the referee does think there's some contact. Maybe it's the resulting uh, obscene language, which the cameras very clearly ca- caught. Yeah. Um, but either way, maybe the soccer gods weren't thrilled and decided to punish him for uh, those infractions and the necklace yeah. infraction with a penalty later on. So the penalty starts with, I want to call it a Jordan Morris pass, but it's not, is no, it? Jordan not. Morris miscontrols the ball, yep. and it goes into Ladero's pass. To be fair, it's, it's off of like a, a misplaced pass that comes off someone else. So he is trying to, it's not like it's right to his feet and he just fails to control. Yeah. He's having to react to... Like a twice kind of like crazy spun yeah. ball. It's a bouncy, bouncy situation, yeah. mm-hmm. right? Um, yeah. Ladero gets it and pushes it like in one direction. Mm. Birch steps across and tackles. Ladero goes down. At the time, I thought that's a dive. Mm. And I think I was sort of, um, that was based on judging him based on what he'd done in terms of holding his face when he didn't really get hit in the face, yeah. right? Yeah. But when we rewatched it, it's just a clumsy tackle from Birch, misses the ball. Uh, gets uh, gets Ladero's leg. Mm-hmm. Down he goes. Yep. Penalty kick. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, it is. There's there's contact, and it's this, it's that weird thing where like you look for the contact at, at the feet because you assume there's gonna be like a trip or a clip, um, and you can easily miss that. First, he comes through Ladero's left knee. That's mm-hmm. where the contact initially occurs, which is obviously gonna knock you off balance. Adjust the way you run, which makes it look like maybe he's dragging his feet a little bit. But I think when you've been hit, you're sort of trying to adjust so that you don't go flying. Yeah, I mean, that's gonna change the mechanics of the way you're running. Then Birch comes through and gets the foot as well. And then Ladera steps up, takes PK, bang, 2-1 to the Seattle Sounders. Yep. This is a tougher uh, return leg because yeah. it goes to, I've forgotten the exact elevation, but it's on the back 52 of 5280, I believe it is. 5,280 feet high at Dick Sporting Goodbye. Or 5820. It's one of the other. It's some combination of those four numbers. It's, there's less oxygen than normal. Let's yeah. put it that way. Yeah. <laughs> So that's going to be the away leg. Colorado are going to have one away goal. And I think I saw, via Will Parchman maybe, um, a quote from Mastroianni that was, uh, yeah, we're going to like wait, <laughs> suffocate them and then beat them after the 60th minute. Because yep. it is hard to go to altitude and perform. That's why I think you looked it up. Colorado. Undefeated at home in the regular season. Yep. yep. So we shall see. Yep. A few draws in there, but uh, mostly wins for Colorado at home. So MLS Conference Final second legs will be next week. Yep, yep, yep. Before that, we have some TSS scouting reports. That we do, my friend. Um, That we do. We have some exciting stuff. We do. Uh, Would you like to go first or second in this uh, the scouting network? I'll go first. All right, Jonathan Holmgren. Mm -hmm. Jonathan Holmgren is scouting Alex Iwobi, and I know because I saw on Twitter Jonathan Holmgren. Put it in the work behind the scenes, contacting people. Ah, uh, we to have get continued the, the tradition of Daryl not reading the scouting report before announcing things. Go ahead. <laughs> oh, well, we didn't start against Manchester United this weekend, uh-huh. <laughs> says Jonathan, um, which is the first time this season that that's happened. Um, Jonathan reached out to Russell Hargreaves <laughs> and Adrian Clark of Arsenal Media and the Arsenal Weekly podcast. Um, Clark replied that he heard he wasn't 100%, he will be, mm-hmm. and Hargreaves thought perhaps the youngster's buddy needed a break after starting so many games. And I have to interject to say I love how much Jonathan seems to have, like, personally taken to Alex Iwobi because at this point he was very much like does this mean he's not going to play anymore does it mean, I've heard he hasn't been playing very well so does that mean like he's on the outs a little bit Jonathan rest easy I don't believe that's the case <laughs> okay Iwobi did start for Nigeria in their most recent World Cup qualifier and did the same for the Gunners against PSG in the Champions League this week last I saw they were winning 2-1 to one, were Arsenal I don't know how much Iwobi had to do with either one of those goals or PSG's go ahead goal but uh, right now things looking okay for Arsenal as far as I know I can tell you that in that game for Nigeria, uh-huh. Iwobi pulled off a rainbow. I oh. saw it on Reddit or maybe Twitter. Yeah. He good. You know what I'm talking? The he rainbow good. overhead yeah. flick? Yeah. Oh, yeah. He's good, that 20-year-old. Um, up next, we have a scouting report from Olaf Danilius, scouting Erdal Rakip, the 20-year-old midfielder from Malmo. Uh, Rakip's season has come to an end, and his Malmo team are champions. Uh, he played 27 of the club's 30 games, but started only 12. We don't know what the future holds for Erdal uh, at club level, <laughs> given that Malmo fired their coach despite winning the league. Um, but we do know that he'll be playing for Sweden in the U21 Euros this summer. It's funny. My, my page says the U12 Euros. So you're just trying to make up for the fact that you don't ever read the scouting reports. <laughs> 
I read the scan reports. <laughs> oh, you mean I don't read ahead? Yeah. Yeah, I read them via email. Uh-huh. Um, okay, up next, uh, Jacob Stolzenbach is scouting Felix Paslak, 18-year-old defender for Dortmund, teammate of Christian Pulisic. I'm really glad you went first, because now you have to read the third. So go ahead and read the beginning of this one. <laughs> okay, <laughs> this was the subject line in yeah. the email, right? The subject line was... Oh, no, it begins with this, too. Oh, does it? <laughs> Tor! Which means Felix Paslak has scored yep. for Dortmund. All right, here's Jacob's report. Paslak started at left back slash left wing back for Dortmund in the Champions mm-hmm. League clash with Legia Warsaw. He scored a header in the 84th minute, but Dortmund did concede four goals and Paslak was playing defence. I still say you come out ahead in that yeah. situation if you're Paslak. Um, so it's not totally good news, but Jacob says Paslak switched to the right side once Derm came on. So my main comment on the game is can Paslak get an American passport and does Bruce Arena like Germans? Uh, no, and Maybe is is my answer. <laughs> I know who does like uh, Paslak. Who's that? Christian Pulisic. That is true. They're best friends. So we I've saw decided. this goal. We saw this goal. We yep. saw Paslak's header, and to his right, he wasn't quite involved with the goal, right? No, it was. Pa- oh, he, no, he definitely Pulisic was. He had the MLS assist on this. Well, he well first he gets the ball. It's like it, I think it comes from a, a Liga Warsaw corner kick. Yes, but it's basically cleared by I think Kagawa. It's like on the floor out to Christian Pulisic, who's standing about forty yards from his own goal. He drives all the way to the end line, squares it for accelerates. I, I can't, right, it might have been Marco Royce who's yes. there on the end. I can't remember, but he shoots it. It's saved by the goalkeeper but it goes up in the air and that's what Paslak heads home there we go mm-hmm. yeah so Pulisic was involved no very heavily involved and that's why Pulisic was standing on the right waving his arms saying come over here Felix Paslak yep. and they do a big teenage Dortmund hug yeah <laughs> right? and it's and you can tell <laughs> and you can tell if you want to like dive deep into it because they do their hug everyone else comes and celebrates and that's the seventh goal I think so it's like the Dortmund players are happy they come over and celebrate with Pulisic and Paslak afterwards they all go away and Paslak and Pulisic continue to celebrate and like <laughs> high five and then they go back and uh, get ready for the restart I mean, these guys are living the dream right yeah. they were playing U19s not long ago and U17s probably before that and but you know they're... U23s which is really yeah. not as good as U19s and now they're still 18s just playing in the Champions League <laughs> yeah. um, also in this game mm-hmm. another Dortmund player another in teenager the scouting I think, yeah. network yeah Usman Dembele being scouted by Kyle Starley. Um, this is mostly stats because they're ridiculous. All right, you ready? All right, let's see. Uh, Kyle's report is that uh, Dembele started on the wing for Dortmund in the 8 4 win um, in the Champions League over Legia Warsaw. Dembele had two assists in two minutes to Kagawa. So Decent. Dembele is basically responsible for the point where this game goes absolutely insane, right? <laughs> and then just continues being insane. Um, the, <laughs> then an assist to Marco Royce. Then a goal for himself on a counter attack before finally subbing out for Schuller in the second half. Not bad. Not bad not at bad all, overall. Mr. Dembele. Hmm. But we knew this, right? We did. You know who was not enjoying this? Emre Moore. Yeah. Not involved. Mm-mm. At least not involved in these goals. I'm not sure if he played or not, actually. I don't, uh, I don't remember I don't seeing know. him. Mm-mm. I don't remember seeing him, and I know he didn't start. I can tell you that much. Things looking up for Dortmund as well. Mm. After that win over Bayern uh, last weekend, they are third in the Bundesliga uh, on 21 points, behind Munich on 24 points, behind. Rassemble Sports Leipzig mm-hmm. on 27 points. I feel like you always commit to saying the full thing and then regret it halfway through. Yeah, yeah. I think I got it though. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> RB Leipzig. There you go. If you would like to join the Total Soccer Show Scouting Network and have a, an exciting young player to scout, we can't guarantee he'll play for Dortmund, but there's a good chance because they keep stacking them up. <laughs> um, you can go to totalsoccershow.com slash subscribe. You will help support the show so that we can keep making shows. Thank you to Jonathan, Olaf, Jacob, and Kyle for the scouting reports that we read out today. Yes, sir. I've got to ask you now, Taylor, what mm-hmm. are you doing the next two days? Uh, eating and then sleeping. Same for me. Yeah. What, eating on Thursday, sleeping on Friday. And sanding. And sanding? Sanding, yeah. Oh, I, I got tables that. to finish. All right. Mm-hmm. Well, you kind of weirdly enjoy that stuff. Right? Yeah. <laughs> this is our way of saying uh, this is the final TSS mm-hmm. of the week. We are going to take a couple of days off for Thanksgiving. We hope you don't mind. Um, we do want to say happy Thanksgiving to everybody listening to TSS right now. We do. So happy Thanksgiving. Now we said it. We did it. Well done. <laughs> I do. I do love Thanksgiving though because it's really? it was the one thing like Christmas here is the same as back in England. Yeah. Thanksgiving is this whole weird American thing that um, I never used to get the last Thursday in November. Oh, yeah, you guys don't no, like thanking people for things, do you? That's no, we weird. just we just do it every day. Oh, I see. <laughs> <laughs> and apologising for things we haven't done. That's oh, the, I see. Yeah. Thing, yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right, so yeah, happy Thanksgiving to everybody listening. Uh, final thing, just want to remind people, totalsoccershow.com slash shop. Uh, we have the TSS t-shirts in partnership with Who Are You Designs. There are two new t-shirts available and professionals will deliver them to you. Mm-hmm. There we are. <laughs> uh, and folks who are going home, uh, spending time with family for Thanksgiving, remember the SNL sketch, Target's parking lot is your friend. <laughs> 
Taylor Rockwell, thank you for taking the time to talk to me today. Right back at you, buddy. Listeners, thank you for listening, and we will be back with you on Monday.